Um, so hi, Armand, welcome back to Journal Club. Also a former MHI scholar, by the way, I forgot to mention that. Um, so hi, Armand, how are you? Hi, MHI scholars and whoever else may be listening. Um, I'm good. Thank you so much for asking. Glad to be back and to see everyone. Well, you know, virtually see everyone. <laughs> yeah. Um, so first let's do, I guess let's kind of go over, um, you know, uh, who you are, what are you doing now, um, and sort of your your history with MHI. That was a lot of questions all at once. I'm sorry. Let's Let's just start with who are you and what are you up to now? Yeah, um, so my name is Orman Derif. I use the, uh, he, they pronouns, so either he, he, he him, or they, them. Um, uh, what am I up to now? Um, I am working in tech uh, currently, so I'm doing that as like career uh, money-making uh, part of my life, but still I'm very passionate about public health um, and the work we're doing, and I've been doing that a while, um, kind of an unofficial capacity um just for my own mental health and uh yeah it's just so I can do something and still care about it um yeah for sure but you know use a by making my money somewhere else and yeah I I totally get that especially in you know I mean I feel like I can say we can all say this as we all work for a nonprofit. it's it's very different to work for a nonprofit versus like a normal type job, if you want to call it that. Um, it's, it's very different, like, it's much harder to make your living <laughs> doing just nonprofit work, although some of us somehow manage, I have no idea how. Um, but it's, you know, it's really important, even if you can't do it as your full time job. Um, so talk a little bit about the public health AOC at New College. I'm really excited to hear about this, because if this had been an AOC when I had first gotten there, that would have been my AOC hands down, <laughs> but it didn't exist. So uh, I'm really excited to hear about this. Yeah, so me and Olympia actually came, we were in the same class at New College and yeah, it did not exist at New College. Um, but as Dr. Merrick can attest, um, I don't take no for an answer and I'm a very persistent um, young individual, just like whenever our, our first set of mini classes on fall 2016, I think it was, um, Dr. Merritt, of course, offers their amazing class, uh, Public Health Disparities and Gender Issues. And uh, obviously super big interest because a lot of people at New College are interested in public health, but we didn't really have a public health program. There were like 80 plus people in the mini class, um, like 30 people or 30 slots, I think, for the class. And Dr. Merritt was, of course, prioritizing upper years because, you know, it's the last chance to take it, et cetera, et cetera. And after the mini class, I remember waiting in line and going up to her and just like begging to be in the class and talking about how the work I'd already done in public health and how passionate I was about it and being like, I will be in this class. And Dr. Merritt was like, all right, you'll, you're in, but let's see. You know, she put me to the test and I think first year, there's so many pandemics, I can't keep track of them now. Um, but the first year, I think it was Zika. I was the Zika czar. Um, it was either Ebola or Zika. It was like, I did that for the second year when I was a TA, I can't remember. So one of those epidemics, um, I was a czar and came to the first class with like a huge epi presentation that doctor blew Dr. Merritt away and was like, oh, this kid actually knows what they're talking about. Um, so that's kind of how I got into it. And then um, I kind of Frankensteined my education together at New College with the public health program, just because my last year, of course, my last year, senior year, is when they decided to gra uh, gra uh, graduate, um, hire the public health professor, like an official public health professional, like start the department, et cetera, et cetera. So I was like, of course I'm gonna take every class there, but you know, it's a little too, mm -hmm. too little too late for my part. But so how I kind of, I know I'm rambling, but how I did my AOC before public health became a thing at New College is they had the global studies program in the international department and mm -hmm. you could do an issue track and choose basically any international issue. And so I chose global health as my international issue and basically um, fulfilled, because I was also a poli sci major. So I basically mm -hmm. took all the, the courses necessary for the political science part of it. And then I just filled everything else with like biology classes, STEM classes, public health classes um, to get like a really well-rounded, uh, exposure. And then um, I did my undergraduate thesis, um, a comparative case study of health systems using HIV AIDS as a proximity indicator uh, for how those uh, health systems, op like uh, are, how effective those health systems are, basically. Wow, that's really awesome. <laughs> that's really, really cool. I remember the first uh, public health class that I took with 
Professor Fenny. Um, and I was just like, so blown away. Uh, and I was like, wow, this is something that people do for a job. This is really cool. I wish I had discovered it three years earlier uh, because it was just so, and it was such a weird time because I was taking that class right when uh, COVID had really just started to become a pandemic. And so we were talking about it all the time. And it was just so weird to be talking about a pandemic while being in a global health class. It was just very like surreal. <laughs> um, yeah. And especially with the HIV AIDS stuff, I feel like it doesn't get talked about as much, you know, like in modern day anymore, but it mm -hmm. is super important. And I feel like, especially with some of the stuff that's been happening um, to my understanding with like monkeypox, we really need to be bringing some of those, those talking points, like those prevention points back about, you know, uh, prophylactics, using condoms, using dental dams, like all of that stuff. We really need to like bring that back in, in full force. Um, so if you, I, I heard this question the other day and I wanted to ask it to you because I just think it's such a fun question. If you could wave a magic wand and have any job that you wanted in the entire world, even a job that doesn't exist, what would you want to do with your degree? Like what would be your you know, total dream, like the, absolutely this would be what I would want to do for the rest of my life. Um, if you give me one second, um, I actually know the exact title from the WHO. Uh, <laughs> and I always forget the exact name. So if I can't find it, I will. Um, uh, World Health Organization. Basically what it would be is the, um, like the under, I can't remember if the secretary or undersecretary or like, I can't remember the official like title, the officer title for it, but it's basically the um, undersecretary of healthcare and health systems for the WHO, which is that, which um, that would be the dream job currently. Um, Cause I have kind of not much desire or interest in doing it at least nationally, considering how horrible pandemic responses have been for the past, well, multiple years, but you know, mm -hmm. however long it's been in the multiple pandemics, but that, um, that title, and then in a dream world, it would be actually with like a unified global health system, not one that right. really exists today. We have kind of a patchwork of it, especially with the WHO framework and the um, different levels and uh, national organizations and collaborations that exist, but kind of a, a unified framework where it's, you know, WHO is a central point that everyone refers to and kind of goes down from there instead of just a patchwork of nations. Yeah, that's really honorable, in my opinion. Um, I, I am like, an arguer, I'm a fighter, which is why I want to go to law school because I just want to, I want to argue with people all day long um, <laughs> about how I'm right. Uh, but I, I respect that a lot, seriously, because I'm, I imagine that would probably be an extremely difficult job uh, and very stressful, but it is also an incredibly important one if the last three years has taught us anything, um, which is that we really, really need a global unified healthcare system and people who are smart enough to be able to manage that system, which being that you were a new college grad, I fully believe that you could do. Um, <laughs> I yeah, like so, to think so. <laughs> so yeah, I, can, can I jump talk? in here for oh, one yeah, second? Yeah, go ahead. I would love some questions from Dr. Merritt also. I would just like to say, well, you know, the beautiful thing is, is that sometimes we know what we want in life. You know, it's about knowing your purpose. Uh, Mara and I got to hear an artist last night speak about her commitment to her craft and that she gets up every seven days a week and goes to work painting and doing art every day and she left like the regular workplace and this is what she does and she's found a way to make a living out of it because it's her absolute passion and she's really gifted at it and so sometimes people come in knowing what it is and Armand had that and I'm just glad I was able to give the opportunity I don't know if you mentioned about being the TA also and all that stuff but um Sometimes you have to have the opportunity to be challenged and then really grow into what it is you think your dream is and then it confirms you. And then it's really never work. You know, it's like my work with community and my work as a doctor. And I could be anywhere. People just seem to know. I could be sitting on a bus stop and people sit down and start telling me their whole life story. I don't know. Maybe they have a certain face. I don't know. So I'm just glad for the rest of you to hear Armand speak with passion and conviction and visualizing. Go for the top. Why, go for it. Why not? You know, I couldn't, there's no doubt that Armand's going to get there and there in the next whatever new intergalactic, you know, 
<laughs> biodiversity of other planets and or whatever. <laughs> be, be in charge of that too, you know. Intergalactic I, health I, organization. Yeah, I wouldn't do justice either with that. Dr. Merritt is very humble, more humble than she should be in my opinion, but I, I would not be where I am and the stuff that I've been able to do. And there, even the research I did without Dr. Merritt and their support, they really truly helped. And are, I clearly, when, it's someone, when you refer back to someone who made an impact in your life that changed your life, I can clearly say Dr. Merritt is, is that person that really just made a difference in my life and made me, you know, got, got am the reason I am where I am today. Amen. So true. <laughs> I, I just 100% agree with that. And it's so it's so nice to hear from another scholar. Also, um, you know, I, I really enjoy doing these interviews with the with the former scholars, because it's just so like, heartwarming, and it makes me feel really good. Like, okay, I'm not gonna like, totally lose my mind when I leave. Uh, when I leave MHI, which will happen, you know, sometime in the future, hopefully not soon. Um, but you know, it it makes me feel like I really am being prepared to do really, really awesome stuff, um, which I feel like is the whole point, not the whole point of this organization, but one of the many incredible benefits uh, you know, that it offers aside from just being an awesome community health organization is also preparing a next the next generation of hopefully, you know, leaders who are going to determine this stuff and really fight for what is right. That's also something that I really appreciate about MHI. I really feel like everybody who comes through here really does fight for what is right at the end of the day. Um, and, you know, tries their absolute best, their, you know, maximum capacity to make an impact, which is just really cool and very rare, I think nowadays. Um, but I'm totally rambling. So um, is there anything else that you want to talk about? Anything that you want to like plug or like an, a thing that is interesting you right now you said you have some public health stuff that you do kind of like on the side if you want to talk about that I don't know it's up to you um, yeah yeah um just some of the stuff because of course I, we no one wants to acknowledge it but we still are dealing with in a pandemic that not mm -hmm. monkeypox yeah. covid and um ever since because I, I know I moved out of Sarasota probably about a year it's been, I think it's been almost a year now wow um time flies when you're in a pandemic but um since then and um you know kind of taking a step back of uh the work that I did officially with MHI I kind of just took what Dr. Merritt taught me and replicated it on my own um kind of just running my own COVID response person to me but team um up here in tampa and getting people access to resources especially with the um uh omicron the first omicron variant back in january um literally like diagnosing my own family members with covid after the doh lost their s s sample results um unvaccinated family members um you know with multiple core comor comorbidities um and literally say saved uh, my abuelita's life but other people's lives as well by getting them early treatment and interventions with the pulse oximeters with you know monitoring care with you know just using my own stethoscope to listen to their lungs and you know making sure they get those early interventions to starve off the long-term consequences um, especially after losing you know several family members to COVID as well um, so just doing that as well as just providing mass tests to people like literally just going out and out of my own pocket just buying COVID tests where I could find them available and giving them out to people that needed them for vulnerable family members um you know they're creating info sheets and documents and then now of course with uh monkeypox see, seems to be doing the same thing again um and stepping in for the role where the government should be but isn't so we're taking it into our own hands to do something about it um but those are just a little bit of the the initiatives that I've been working on myself and kind of in my own capacity. Yeah, all, well, all of that stuff is so important though. Like, even if it's like just a group of like, I feel like anybody could really take our model and do it anywhere with like pretty much any amount of people. Um, like there really is no limit to scale on the kind of model that MHI has created for like community health and intervention. People, you could literally get to like three friends together and and do this take the techniques that MHI oh. does and do it in your community anywhere you let know me, what I mean which I me. think is just so incredible it's really Absolutely. fantastic and it's awesome to hear you taking that to another part of the community I know Tampa I'm sure you can attest has 
a ton of COVID cases and probably also has a lot of monkeypox cases, I would assume, mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. you know, relatively. Uh, and, you know, applying those same practices. Because unfortunately, Dr. Merritt cannot be everywhere at once, which is a tr one of the true great uh, shames of the world. But um, we can make a bunch of little Dr. Merritts, you know, running MHIs everywhere because we can just spread these ideas as far as we can get them. That's true. She does try to be everywhere at once. <laughs> I was going to say, she tries. It's almost but she like shouldn't. there's at least two and a half of her at exactly. all times. Which minimum. she shouldn't. She needs to sit down and rest. <laughs> like I always tell her. Relax. She doesn't want to, but I'm like, you Please. need to take a rest because without you, you know, it wouldn't be possible. So it's so true. Um, yeah. And yeah. Well, they, they think I've perfected cloning. So even when I think I'm taking a rest, it's still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's all beautiful and, and and it's it's music to my ears because this is our next presentation at the and national medical association um in a week week and a half we're going to be talking about data for developing advocacy and creating a replicable program and we've got the cookbook we've got the systems of operation we've got you know the, the, all of the ingredients and hopeful that we will inspire others just like what you're saying because it's been us on the front lines that have held the line for communities and i think that's Absolutely. important thing you guys had to live through this a hard lesson but to see the power of taking action as opposed to helplessly sitting around wondering what's going to happen next it's a much I much better thing for self-advocacy don't you think Ormond? oh absolutely i was it's funny you say that too because a lot of i feel like a lot of people especially with covid with monkeypox with inflation everything going on there's just a very sense of defeatism and you know like everything's just getting worse which is true but um also I, if, if anyone's familiar with the movie don't look up um i great movie love that movie metaphor for climate change turned into a metaphor for COVID as well um but i watched that movie again last night because i i was like oh i really like that movie i want to see it again more so not to just relish in how bad things are but as a sense of inspiration to be like no that's this is not going to be us i refuse to sit around and let it end up like this like i'll be damned sorry for the pg rating but um you know i'll i'll I, I'll, I won't sit back and let something like this happen again, especially that's kind of where I came into public health with from seeing it within my own family and health disparities. Um, my uh, mom, a side of the family is Mexican um, and in, indigenous and they've faced incredible health barriers and disparities in just trying to access basic care um, in this country and get, even getting care, the treatment they received, um, the diagnoses, et cetera. And on top of that, also being Latino, but a queer person myself, the impact, of course, that HIV AIDS had on the queer community, but also the queer community of color and seeing a lot of the same things replicated now with the monkeypox outbreak. Um, it's just given me a real uh, passion, a renewed passion, I should say. Yeah, of course. I mean, it's just so, you know, I, we've talked a lot actually on this podcast, I think, about how to avoid getting pessimistic or feeling like you can't do anything. Um, and I think the reason that we focused on that so much is not only because there are, you know, some of us scholars here who go on Twitter at least once a week and therefore have this feeling, um, but also because there are a ton of young people who feel this way, uh, who feel and who maybe, you know, queer, maybe people of color, maybe indigenous who feel this way when they look at the news, when they look at social media. Um, and I just want to say personally, um, you know, before I open it up to questions, which we will shortly do, I just want to say personally that um, that feeling of like dread or pessimism can really stop you from making a difference where you can be making one. If you even if you think that it is actually impossible for you to make any difference, act like it is. Because regardless of whether you can or not, the fact that you're trying will inspire other people around you to try as well. Um, and the more people you get to do that, just like Dr. Merritt was talking about, about um, Malcolm Gladwell's tipping point, the more people you can get to do that, at a certain point, it will start to take effect. Um, so with that, I want to open it up to questions from any of the other scholars, anybody else who's on the call, 
Um, does anyone have questions for Ormond or, um, you know, any of the things that they've talked about or, you know, whatever, just open public uh, question time. Yeah, I do. Um, hi, Ormond. My name is Glamy. I don't know if you heard me earlier speaking, but um, I'm a fourth year rising student at New College. I know this is going to be the second half of our podcast, so some people may not know who I am. I'm an art major and a stat, um, or I'm pursuing an art major with a stat minor. Um, I wanted to ask you, like, when you joined MHI, like, what was the first instance where you were like, yeah, th I'm making an impact. Like, this is, this is where I need to be. Um, or what, mm, excuse me, what was the moment where you were like, I like what we're doing here? Um, oh my God. Uh, I'm like trying to think of the moment that's so long ago I feel so old now even though I'm not but pandemic makes us feel like we've lived like three lives um, I would say probably the moment where I was like oh like this this work matters this is like different this is awesome was um, I forget the exact name so excuse me Dr. Merritt for forgetting but we did a presentation at the community foundation of Sarasota about um, new towns health equity health equity equity excuse me access or um rates of something i forget what it was it was like six years ago so you have to excuse me but we did a presentation on that um in front of a lot of just like local community leaders and of course people who should already be caring about this but weren't but just seeing um the impact that we had and kind of like the ability to speak to this work and do this work and do this work without a lot of the red tape and kind of under the radar especially with political health being so polarized and politically charged um it was before covid it obviously if you've lived in florida which uh, mhi is based in florida you know how incredibly political it's gotten um but yeah it was it was a really awesome opportunity to do a lot of work without having to worry about like you know the politics of a public health department for example and i think a lot of that was really reinforced with the COVID response team and working with MHI on that and, and helping to be like a program manager or whatever my role title was with, for the Latinx community. Um, that was also like three years ago, too many, uh, too many, like I said, three different lives. I don't know which one is which, um, but um, yeah, just like doing that work and literally seeing the impact we had of like calling and interfacing with patients daily um to you know make sure they had a pulse oximeter making sure we're introducing early interventions and getting them treatment when the blood oxygen level is dropping when their heart rate is increasing to you know really starve off you know disability disability excuse me death um and you know these other things that covid was happening or that was causing before we had our pharmaceutical interventions um so i think those are two probably two of the most pinnacle um areas and regions that I can think of, of course, the community foundation presentation being like the first one, um, first of many. Thank you. That was an awesome response. Um, and, I, don't know, like, I like asking that question in particular, just because like, personally, for me, I, I don't work directly with people, but I indirectly work with people by helping promote MHI and like, through um, images and um, data analytics and whatnot. And it's just really interesting to hear a different perspective. So thank you again. Yeah, of course. And that work is also super important. That's actually where I really started in public health because I came from political science, really. I was super into politics. Um, as anyone at New College in my time knew, I was never at New College. I was also always in Washington, DC. Um, at like on Capitol Hill, lo like lobbying, advocating, all the stuff. Um, but how I kind of got into that was through public health. And that's what I did. I didn't do a lot of like the um, clinicals. I didn't do a lot of like the patient interface really. I was I started doing a lot of the advocacy and I started it from the political end and kind of ended up on the clinical end um, being like, oh no, I actually do like working with patients. I do like making this impact as well as like the political yeah, no, absolutely. And just to finish the point before the recording stop was um, data people, anyone that works on the team or in public health is super important. I was speaking about data specifically because the meetings I had and the advocacy work I was doing relied on data, it relied on the report, it relied on these metrics and these visualizations that we worked on that other people worked on um, to really tell the story and to do the advocacy. So everyone, no matter what part they play it plays a very influential role and we couldn't do the work without either one of the other people yeah 
definitely. That's so true. I mean, I obviously feel that way because I'm primarily data. Um, but Dr. Merritt has had to convince me a couple of times because there are a few times where I was like, I don't know, I'm looking at the numbers and they're just so awful and I feel so horrible. And Dr. Merritt was like, no, listen, look at the numbers of people that we have helped. Look at, you know that you're a numbers person. So look at the number of people that we've helped. And that really helped me to like sort of center it and be like, okay, I know, I know. Um, so I just want to open it up. I think we have time for like maybe one more question. If there's anybody else who has a question for Armand before we have to wrap up. Anybody, Mo or maybe Onyx? I do have a question, but it's not a two minute question. <laughs> Oh no. Okay. Well, well I um, I don't know. Is it like a five or seven minute question? We might be able to stretch it like a little bit. I think so. I think so. It depends how okay. um, I'll be quick. I'll... Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'll, I'll pitch it. We'll see. So my question is like, I was like, one thing that occurred to me while you're talking about like stepping in for the public health response that should be existing on a system scale, but as an individual. And I feel like that connects a lot to like work we do as, as MHI, like some of the things we're doing like should be happening on a systems level with systems level funding. Uh, but we're stepping in to fill that and you see that all over, right? And I guess like, how do you keep your head on? <laughs> how do you keep your head on? Um, and, um, how do you, uh, I guess, like set boundaries at times? Because there's so much at stake. There's so much at stake, you know? Yeah, um, absolutely. That's honestly um, kind of a, a loaded question. Not on your, not, not for me, but just like a loaded response, I guess I should give. Um, and I will make it concise, but that's honestly um, one of the hard things and something I definitely struggled with. Uh, it's honestly one of the main reasons that I didn't really pursue public health as a career. Like I was going to, but living, writing a thesis on a pandemic and systemic response during the pandemic in Florida and then living through the pandemic in Florida of all places kind of just um, exhausted me and like made me just give up professionally wise on that just because I felt like I could still make an impact. Obviously, I'm still passionate about it. Obviously, I still do the work, but it couldn't just be my whole life, if that makes sense, you know, like, I don't think I could have just like done it um for me personally I just I couldn't like go to work every day and do it and then you know also be passionate about it and things like that and you know if we you know maybe if I live somewhere else like in Mexico or Cuba or in Europe you know, with better health systems I probably could do it professionally or like for the WHO but uh, that's just something I had to deal personally but I think the main thing that helps me to overcome this and feel like you know get rid get over the all is lost type of feeling is remembering that at the end of the day I do it because I'm passionate about it I'm not doing it because I'm getting a check I'm not doing it because of a status symbol of you know any of these things that a lot of people like you know base their careers off of or like pursue a career for I'm not really doing it for that I'm doing it because I, I truly and quite frankly care about it and would literally give my life for it um and the people that i'm working to protect and to help um and i just want to make the world a better place and i think public health is the um easiest isn't the right word but like the best easiest quickest way to get that stuff done um because it's kind of a mixture of both doing something on the individual level but it's a systemic thing that you're working on and, and working about population health and community health um which is both the micro and the macro so does that answer your question I, sorry if that was like downy but um I yeah that's what my yeah, what no, I well, say. Help, thank you I was like I don't want to like push the meeting super over but part of yeah, like yeah. what I'm doing is just I guess like a self uh maintenance aspect I don't even want to say self-care because that's been so like Honestly, I think it's very important in terms of boundaries to, to going back to that is to like set, you know, pretty strict boundaries for yourselves in terms of like downtime of terms of just like not worrying about it. you can't really just um, think about it all the time, which I try to not to. And of course, you know, it's pre, uh, easier said than done, but just, you know, really reserving time to, you know, take time for yourself and do something that matters to you. Like for me, every day I make sure like after 6 p.m. I am not 
available. I, that is like my cooking time, that's me time. That's time that I simply focus on me, like doing laundry, doing chore, chores, you know, I mean, once in a while, there'll be like a meeting that happens that, you know, after work hours, et cetera, of course, like, you know, there's exceptions, of course, but like for the regular, you know, having that and having built in like vacations, like self-care for yourself like you know i i'm gonna go we live in florida so we have this luxury as a you know a quick way but i'm gonna go to the beach for the weekend you know i'm gonna go spend the weekend at st pete see the sunset like see the world around me um and really kind of baking that into your everyday routine um or maybe like a weekly routine maybe not every day but you know always just be taking time for yourself and to have fun to live life because at the end of the day and i think something that covid really taught us and that we're all dealing with is that you know life is short anything can happen you know there, tomorrow another crazy thing could happen and change the complete trajectory of our lives we could all be locked at home again we could all be you know wandering the streets no one knows and so you really just need to live every life or every life live every day um you know to the best that you can to the fullest and really just enjoy it because you really for me personally, I just want to be able to, if I were to get hit by a bus tomorrow, I just want to be able to just, you know, pass on and move on and be like, you know what, I lived a good life. I had a good fun. I enjoyed myself. I made a positive impact. And, you know, I care and love for everyone that I, I was, whose lives I was part of. Sorry to get philosophical. But. Yeah, thank you. That helps. Thank you so much. I feel like this might be one of the, one of the best interviews we've ever done. This was a really, really good one. <laughs> oh um, I think I can say that on the record. It was really, really oh inspiring God. and very uh, just good. I don't know. I don't know if it's because we're close in age. So I feel like I can talk to you and it's very conversational, but it's just very, it was really, really awesome. Um, okay. So you, thank you, you so much. <laughs> no, really. Thank you. Um, so I want to thank Again, Ormond Derek, uh, do you have like a do you have a social media that you want to plug? I don't know if that's something that you that you do. Um, I'm on Instagram, I guess. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> you don't have uh, to if you don't I'm want like, to. I'm trying to. I can trying to think of my. Uh, I mean, it's really easy. It's like you're following Ormond or something like that. But all right, I'm always well, if you ever want to keep up on my life, I'm always on Instagram. So. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on to talk to us. We're gonna wrap it up now. Um and. Yeah, thank you guys for listening. Uh, we will be back next week on Friday, which will be the 29th, I think. Um, so look out, that will be our actually our last real episode before the um, before we start just doing interviews. This will be like the last journal club um, meeting, which is kind of sad, but it's okay because um, we've had a great time. Any Any closing comments from anyone? Yeah. If not, um, I'm I just have stop a the recording. quick work. I have a, oh, you can stop recording for this. Oh, okay. But. All right.